Okay, so I think we'll go ahead and get started here. If I can figure out how to do the. Do we record the cloud or the computer? Cloud. Recording in progress. For those of you who don't know, you're being recorded. <laughs> Everybody in the meeting, you huh? Free food. Everybody. Okay, well, uh, my name is David Dowdy. I'm the building code official for the town of Dolores. Um, I wear a lot of hats here at the town. <laughs> um, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, those that are joining by Zoom, if you could mute your microphones uh, so we can get any feedback, I appreciate that. Uh, I've got this time where it's about 45 minutes. Um, I blocked out a two hour period because if we went over, Zoom cut you off, and I didn't want to have that happen. Um, we have refreshments, as Ann told you. The restroom's right back here. Uh, there's two of them. They're not they're unisex, so you can use either one. Um, there's coffee, water, uh, it looks like a fruit tray, and then some donuts. Um, anyhow, so I want to thank you all for coming. And what this is for, um, the town of Dolores, we've been experiencing some significant growth. Uh, we've had some issues come up that that we've got to get addressed, which is the reason we're doing this. Um, we've, we've had some uh, issues that have come up. Um, and I want to say that we're not blaming anybody. We're not holding anybody accountable for this, for anything that's happened. Um, there's a lot of he said, she said, she, she said going on out there. Um, and so this isn't pointed at any one person. We just need to get everybody on the same page so that everybody understands what's going on in the town of Dolores. And there's several issues that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so one of the issues we're going to be talking about is the building permit requirement process in the town of Dolores. We're going to be talking about short-term rentals, uh, the adoption of the 2021 building codes and fire codes. Um, and then we're going to be talking about some of the other issues that have been going on. So Anne, if you could pull up the letter, letter to the realtors. So I sent a letter to uh, the Board of Realtors a while back, kind of addressing what was going on. Um, we're still having some of the issues going on with that. Uh, yeah, you'll have to share screen. I'm getting it. Perfect. Um, and I don't know if you got a copy of this letter. We're going to provide a copy of this letter for you. And then we have a copy of everything. We have the PowerPoint presentation. We have the building code requirements, the short-term rental requirements. Um, and we encourage you to take a copy of that at the end of this meeting. If you have questions, if you can hold those till the end of the meeting, um, I think it'll make it go a lot faster. Because um, some of these questions are going to get answered as we go through here, I think. So we'll kind of go through that here. Um, so kind of what happened was we've had some, the Dolores has zoning. We have uh, requirements for zoning. And because a property is zoned for a specific use uh, does not mean that that property can use that use. Um, let's say that we have a, a commercial building downtown uh, and it's zoned for everything, including residential. That does not mean that somebody can buy that building and move in as a residential property, okay? It means that that right exists but they have to go through a process in order to do that. And so we've had several commercial properties converted in town illegally um, that do not meet the requirements of the code or the town zoning ordinances. So that's kind of what started this process. And then the town, we're on the, currently on the 2006 International Building Code series, um, which is five code cycles behind. Um, and so we're updating to the 2021 code. And so we wanted to make everybody aware of that so you could tell your customers, um, be prepared for that and the requirements that go along with that. All right, so I'm gonna jump in with uh, building permits. And uh, if you can pull that up, Ann, pull the building permit requirement up. And then if somebody wants to hand these out to you. Which one did you um, The building permit. I'm looking. How do you integrate? It says integrate sale offer. Is that something I have to pick? 
because it says, please select the con the offer you would like to integrate with. Contract buy and sell residential 1023. So that's the only one. Please select two property values to search with. Uh, okay, 714. Hartman. Trista. Keaton. There we go. Okay, yes, yeah, so that's the one. I'm screen sharing. Yes. Sorry, guys. All right, so hopefully all of these are here. Just take one of these and pass them along. Yeah. In this packet, you're going to find things like three pages back is copied this document. So you can kind of follow along. So as I told you, Dolores, uh, we have the building code adopted in the town of Dolores, the whole code family. Um, and in the building code, as well as in our zoning code, we have a requirement for a change of use. So anytime a property uh, has a certificate of occupancy issued for it, and you want to change that use. So let's just take the doctor's office over here. It was a doctor's office, so it's a B, a business occupancy. And somebody wants to move into it and turn it into a residential. That is a right permitted under the land use code, but it requires a change of use. So the codes, the building code, the land use code require, anytime you change the use of an occupancy of the building, that a new certificate of occupancy has to be issued. So if somebody wants to move into that, they can't, they can't just move in and set it up as a, as a residential occupancy. They're gonna to have to contact the town. The town's going to inspect that building and it has to meet the requirements of that new occupancy. For example, um, it has to have a working kitchen with a stove, an oven stove, a refrigerator and a sink and a certain amount of square footage. It has to have a working restroom, including a shower or a tub, okay, which the doctor's office did not have at the time. So in order to do that, the client would have to come to the town. They're going to have to say, hey, I want to move into this building. I'm going to turn it into my single family house. Um, we're going to tell them what they have to do to meet those requirements in order to do that. And then they're going to be have to pull a permit for that. There's a process they have to go through. Okay. Um, the, the building code requires that in section 105.1. It also requires it in the land use code. Now, when is a building permit required in the town of Dolores? So if you'll go to the section that says, when is a building permit required? <clears throat> there are things that, are, that a client can do to their property that do not require a building permit. Let's say they want to change their carpeting in their house or their kitchen cabinets, right? That does not require a permit. So if somebody wants to remodel the inside, they want to paint, they want to change uh, curtains, they want to change uh, even a window without changing the size of that window. They just sit, don't like that window, they want to put a new window in. That does not require a permit, okay? But let's say they don't like that window, they want to move it to a different wall. That now requires a permit. So if you relocate a door or window or exiting path, that requires a permit, okay? Um, electrical repairs, if you uh, are working on your own primary residence, it's where you live, um, it's your occupancy that you live in all the time, you can do your own electrical work, you can do your own plumbing work. Let's say that you own a second home and you're going to replace some electrical in it or plumbing in it. You cannot do your own plumbing or electrical in that building. That's against the law in the state of Colorado. You have to have a licensed plumber or a licensed electrician do that work. Um, the state of Colorado has really cracked down uh, recently. Uh, they came into the town. We are one of the few jurisdictions that do our own plumbing inspections. We don't do the electrical inspections, but we verify that the state has done them. So that's one of the things I have on the checkoff is if a permit is pulled, uh, I have to see that the electric, uh, state electrical inspector has done that inspection. Um, so what the state has done is they've cracked down and they've said only licensed plumbers can do work in the state of Colorado. And so they require the town of Dolores, since we do our own inspections, 
I have to keep a record of the plumber that's doing the work on whatever job. So I have to have a copy of their state of Colorado plumbing license. I have to have a copy of their master plumber certification. I have to have a copy of their journeyman and their apprentices. If I show up on a job that has a licensed plumber on it and he's not there and he has an apprentice there working without him being there, I have to shut that job down. I have to red tag that job and stop work. So the state has really cracked down on the, the licensed plumbing requirements for plumbers and then also for electricians. Um, I've had a couple of, of electricians and three or four plumbers that are very upset uh, because they've been doing work in Montezuma County for 30, 40 years. However, they're not licensed in the state. They don't have a master certificate and they are no longer allowed to do work in the town of Dolores. Okay? Now they could if they own the house, it's their own primary residence. They could do their own plumbing and electrical. So those are the things that, that we've got to get out to the public um, because we're having some serious messes with uh, people doing their own electrical and especially in second homes or short-term rental stuff. Okay. Um, some of the things that were uh, emergency repairs. If you've got an emergency repair in a property, let's say a pipe breaks, right? So you need to you need to do something. You're allowed to do those kind of repairs yourself. You don't have to have a plumber to do that. If you um, have a client who wants to replace all of their sinks and their, their toilets and all of that, that doesn't require a permit. Now, if they want to move a sink or they want to add a bathroom, that requires a permit. Okay, so basically if you can tell your clients that if it's a superficial kind of remodel, they can do that without a permit for the most part, right? But if it requires moving something or adding something or moving a wall or any of that kind of stuff or installing the plumbing that's behind the walls, those require permits. Okay? Now they may be able to do their own plumbing, their own electrical, but it still requires a permit. Okay? The best thing to do is to tell your client any kind of project you're thinking about doing in the town of Dolores, contact the town. We would love to sit down and talk with them about their project and if it's going to require a permit or not. Okay? Then that way they're not dealing with a mess at the end. Okay? All right. So some of the common questions are, do I need a permit to change a window? Uh, as long as the window is the same size, you don't. Uh, do I need a window to, uh, a permit to replace my roof? The answer is yes. Yes. In the town of Dolores, if you're going to re-roof a house, that requires a permit because there's several inspections that have to occur. I have to inspect the underneath side of the, of the, the roof to make sure that the, the substrate, the, the, the structural part of the roof is intact and there's no rot. And then I inspect the, the uh, bithane or the tar paper or whatever they go on next before they put the sheeting on and, and I inspect the final product. Uh, do I need a permit to replace my flooring? No. Uh, do I need a permit to sheetrock a room? Yes, you need a permit. Anytime you remove this structural component of a wall, um, not wallpaper, not paneling, that kind of thing, but if you take the, the room down to the studs, then it's going to require a permit to put the sheetrock back on because it requires inspections before you take that, that sheetrock. Uh, do I need a permit to paint my house? No. Um, do I need a permit to add an electrical plug? That would be yes. Um, anyhow, so you can read the rest of this as we go through there. All right, go ahead, Ann, and let's pull up short-term rental. Please. So in the town of Dolores, um, <laughs> we kind of got hit with the short-term rental market about two years ago. So what happened was we had a lot of people um, to buying properties in town, converting them to short-term rental. There was no process in the town that said you could or couldn't do that. Um, the, the town board actually had a couple of friends come up to them and say, hey, I can't find a place to rent in Dolores. Uh, they just want to rent for short-term rental. So the town board asked me to look into that. Um, I went and took some training at the national level uh, on short-term rentals, and then we came up with a process. We've been working on short-term rental the regulations for about 18 months. Is that correct, Ian? About that long. So about 18 months we've been working on this process. Uh, we now have a regulation in place. Um, and so a full-time short-term rental, that's one where uh, you buy a house in the town of Dolores and you rent it out, okay? Or one that's half-time. I'm gonna live in my house and I'm gonna go to Alaska in the summertime and I'm gonna rent my house out here in Dolores. Those are limited um, by, the, by 7% 
of the residential properties that are available in town in Dolores. So right now that's 22. Um, to give you an idea, when we started this process, we had six identified short-term rental properties. I now have 27 applications for short-term rentals in the town of Dolores for 22 that are available. So I mean, some of them are not gonna get their short-term rental. They're in a line and as I inspect them, um, if they pass the inspections, then they get a permit, uh, an operational permit. So I don't know where it's gonna fall out because I've had a couple of people withdraw their application saying they've changed their mind. So in the process, we've had people say, eh, it's not for me. Um, in the town, one of the things you're gonna have to do, again, we're you're changing the occupancy of this structure. So a single family residential property by the building codes is an R3, residential three, okay? It's a single family or a duplex kind of structure in which one or two families are living. A short-term rental is an R1, which is uh, residential one, which is the exact same thing as a hotel or motel. So the fire codes look at a short-term rental no differently than they look at a hotel or motel. They have a lot more requirements. Um, you have fire requirements, you have escape route requirements. So somebody can't just purchase a house and turn it into a short-term rental. It requires a change of use and occupancy, okay? It's permitted by use under the land use code, but it still has a process it has to go through. Um, if they're gonna live in that property, um, we, have a, we have two here in town where they just rent a room out. So they live in the house and they rent the room out um, to passerbys. Um, that's not limited by the short-term rental uh, procedure. Same thing with an accessory dwelling unit. Let's say we have somebody buys a house in town that has a mother-in-law quarters on it. So we basically got two residential structures on one piece of property. Those people can live in the house and they can rent that, that accessory dwelling unit out as a short-term rental. Those are not limited under the requirements in the town. Um, they still have to get an occupational permit. They have to have a separate water tap and sewer tap. So they cannot, uh, they can't just build an accessory dwelling unit and tie onto the same water system, the same water line and have one water tap. They have to have two water taps. So there's a whole lot of requirements to go into the short-term rental market in the town of Dolores. <clears throat> Uh, historic buildings under short-term rental. Um, you can use an historic building as a short-term rental. If you change the use or occupancy in a, in a historic building, it still has a certain level of requirements that it has to meet under the building code and fire codes. So uh, just because a building is historic doesn't mean it's hands-off, you can't touch, they don't have to bring it up to code. They do have to bring it up to a certain level of code, depending upon the level of, of um, remodel that they're going to do. <clears throat> the inspections, so there has to be a fire inspection conducted uh, under a short-term rental procedure. It's a pretty in-depth inspection. Um, it's about seven pages of stuff that I'm looking at when I inspect a short-term rental property. I'm inspecting the heating system. I'm in inspecting the gas shutoffs. I'm inspecting the GFI grounding systems, actually testing every one. Um, I'm inspecting um, filters in heating systems and air conditioning systems. I'm inspecting the electrical box, inspecting any kind of fireplace or wood stove for clearances, uh, for chimney clearances against um, trees, barbecues and where they're placed. Actually, had, on one of the inspections I did here in town, uh, they had a barbecue that was sitting on a covered back porch. Um, and they'd used it so many times that it actually had charred the wood behind on the wall behind the barbecue. Um, so the barbecue has to be 10 feet away from any combustible material. Uh, so those are the kind of things I look at. It's pretty in-depth inspection that's required. Okay, and let's go to adoption of the 2021 codes. That's the PowerPoint. Yeah. Yep, it's coming up. And then if you start the PowerPoint presentation, I think it'll... Can you, 
beginning. Yeah, just go from there. So, so currently, the town of Dolores, we already have the building codes adopted. We've been under code regulations in the town for a long time. Um, we are currently on the 2006 International Building Code and International Fire Code, uh, as well as the rest of the ICC codes that are referenced by those two standards. Okay, and we'll go to the next page. And the next page. So believe it or not, uh, there used to be a building code, and it, it could be this simple, I guess. <laughs> Uh, it was called the Code of Harumbai. And what it was was if you were a builder and you built something and somebody lived in that and that thing collapsed or burned down and killed somebody, you were put to death. If you did that and your the owner's son or family member died, then your son or family member were put to death. So that's kind of where the code started way back when. Um, thank God we're not to that point anymore, any longer, but that gives you an idea how far the codes go back. Okay, and. In the town of Dolores, uh, shortly after the town incorporated, um, they passed some rules and regulations, uh, and they determined there were going to be standards followed for buildings, especially in the downtown area. As an example, any building that was tied to another building, right, had to have a rock wall between it. And that rock wall had to penetrate the roof so that if this building on the left burned down, it didn't affect the building on the right. So they had some standards they followed way back uh, at the turn of the century. In 2007, the town of Dolores adopted the International Building Code, the 2006 series, uh, and the International Fire Code and all reference codes. Uh, the town is still operating on the 06 edition of the code. And to give you a, an idea, the code is, is um, rewritten and restudied every three years. So we're on five code cycles behind in the town of Dolores. Um, okay, and next slide. So, what, you may ask, what's changed since the 06 code was adopted? Well, YouTube was invented. Um, world population reached 7 billion. Houses can be 3D printed now. Uh, Self-healing concrete. The building is front and center. Um, transparent aluminum, light generating concrete. There's all kinds of things that have happened since the 06 code. And what, the reason I'm pointing that out is because in the 06 code, as we have it adopted, it does not allow for us to recognize some of these new, new products and new systems for building. One of the biggest ones is the green building. The 06 code didn't recognize that as much. So solar and some of these um, green energy savings products and systems were not approved under the 06. And so as the 06 is still in place, I have a difficult time allowing people to do that. I have to, there's a whole process I have to go through in order to allow that. Where the new code, the 2021 code, recognizes those and gives credit for that. So it has a whole process for that. Okay, Ann? Oops. Know your phone. Know your phone. <clears throat> okay, so the building codes, uh, right in the front of any of the building codes, it, it, it lets you know that the building code is the minimum standard. So you're going to hear a lot of people, especially in Montezuma County, right? Montezuma County, there are no building codes, and people don't want building codes. Um, they, they think the building codes are this really overbearing, overreaching product, and it isn't. It's the minimum requirements under which you can build safely. And so as a minimum standard, it doesn't have a lot of super over-the-top requirements, right? Um, and so I want to point that out for structural integrity, construction materials, and fire protection. So it's the minimum requirement uh, based on that. Okay. Okay, next one. So the codes, every three years, there's a process at ICC, and ICC stands for uh, International Code Council, and what they do is they review the code every three years. They re review the building code, the residential code, the fire codes, um, and what they do is they look at that code and they look at what's changed in that code. Are there things that are no longer relevant? Are there wording that's incorrect? Do we have conflicts between other codes and what we've got written? And then they also take in uh, public input. So you as, as realtors could actually write in a code change and submit it to ICC. Every code change, it change is reviewed. It goes through a process. I sit in on, I actually sit on code writing councils. I help write codes for an FPA for all the wild, wild, uh, wildland interface codes. 
So if it's in the wildland interface, it's construction, it's water supplies, uh, building materials, I actually sit on that code as an expert writing that code. And so we review those, those inputs from the public and we look, number one is their relevance. Is what they're asking to change relevant to what that code section is saying? If it does, it goes to a next level. At the next level, they determine, you know, what is the relevance? What is wrong with the code or what are they trying to say? Um, somebody could say, I don't know, I don't want rescue windows and bedrooms anymore. And then they could write their reasoning why, and then the code council is going to look at that. They're going to determine, is that in fact relevant to that section? If it is, they're going to, they're going to move it on. If it isn't, they're going to send that person the document back saying why. They're going to state the reasons it's not relevant. Uh, they may wish to rewrite it and resubmit it. Then it goes through an entire process. Um, the code reviewers are made up of plumbers, firefighters, professionals, engineers, realtors. The Real American Association of Realtors has two members sitting on, this, on these councils. So you have a voice in the code being changed or adopted at the national level. And so all these people get together um, and we do it every year. We do a, a code meeting and we discuss these changes. Um, we argue back and forth. Um, we come up with expert testimonies and then we decide, does that have relevance? Do, does it make it into the new code? If it does, we change the code and then every three years the code is republished and then resubmitted and that's the new code. So that's the code cycle and the process that follows. So I think I've already covered this, is basically explaining that. And why are building codes, why are they necessary? The building codes help the communities sustain safer buildings, okay? This, in this example here, um, in this area of the country, uh, the code was not, did not require a safe room. However, this gentleman built a safe room, and as you can tell, it's a testimony to code things and, and things in the code and what works and what doesn't work. This, is a, this now is a code requirement in Tornado, Tornado Alley. You have to have a safe room in every house built. Okay, next one. Building codes reduce property and financial losses. Um, if you have a house that you sell and you have somebody that comes along, you have a house inspector come along and the wiring isn't safe, um, you know, either the issues you're dealing with that, with stuff that you find in these houses that you sell that have, that, that don't meet the codes, right? Uh, which would probably be a nightmare in Montezuma County. Uh, building codes assist faster recoveries after disasters. Building codes protect community tax base. So these houses that and properties that are built under current codes have a higher tax rate, higher tax base, is they're safer buildings. Uh, building codes provide better loan values and interest rates. There's actually some loan companies, as you well know, um, that will not lend money on, on properties that are not up to current standard. There's actually some states, Alaska being one of them, where if your fire district has a class 10, you cannot sell insurance in that in that fire district, in that area. So there, all these codes work together uh, for for the benefit of the public. Okay. Yep. Well, that's good. And then insurance companies provide premium discounts for wind, fire, flood, earthquake, building construction costs, uh, reduced flood insurance rates. And so, in the town of Dolores, and go to the next one. Um, one of the one of the big things with being on the most current code is um, ISO, Insurance Services Offices. So there, there's a division, they're, they're a company, owned, they're called Vera Risk. They own ISO. There's two divisions of ISO, well, there's multiple, but the two that affect this community are the insurance rating of the fire district. So they're gonna rate the fire district on several things and they're gonna give them a grade, right? And then insurance is sold at a rate in, based on the rating the fire district gets. In the towns, they're going to base it on the uh, building grading effectiveness schedule. So what that is, is they're going to come in and they look at the building department. They look at the town of Dolores' building department. They start off with what code are you on? Okay. How often do you do inspections? Do you do business inspections? Do you have changes to the code? Have you uh, adopted 
you know, uh, reduce the requirements of the building code. Um, they look at your, your inspector's credentials and their certification. Are they certified? Are they doing continuing education? They go through this whole process and then they give a grade from one to 10, one's the best, 10's the worst. Um, in the past, before I came here, uh, Dolores had a class 10. So whenever ISO came into the town, somebody had told them, we don't want to participate in that. So they didn't get rated. So they just rated them a class 10. What that does is the FEMA flood insurance rates are tied directly to that ISO classification. So in the town of Dolores, everybody that has flood insurance and anybody that has a loan has to have flood insurance in the town of Dolores, okay? They're paying the highest rates possible for a FEMA flood insurance rate. Uh, we just had a local citizen at the last board meeting call in during the board meeting and he was very upset. Um, he just got his new FEMA flood insurance for the year, and it went from $600 to $1,500. Um, he asked them, why is my flood insurance going up? And they told him it's because of the town's ISO rating went to a class 10 uh, for their building score, and it's because they're not on the current edition of the building code. That's one of the reasons we're doing the new building code. Um, so we went through our rating, we got our paperwork back from ISO. It says, congratulations, you're a class five. However, since you're on the 2006 International Building Code, you're gonna get no credit for that, so we have to rate you a class 10. So had we been on the current code, we'd have been a class five and everybody's insurance rates would have dropped, their flood insurance rates. And as soon as we get to the new code, we can have ISO come back in here and we'll be a class four. I've been working on other things that ISO requires, so we should be a class four which is gonna be the lowest in the entire area. So that should help everybody's insurance rates, but we have to be on the, on the new code. That's one of the reasons we are adopting the 2021 codes. Okay, any amendments that weaken the code? It's okay, that's fine. Any amendments that weaken the code or lessen the requirements, uh, reduce your ISO rating as well. Okay, and so what's changed from 06 to 21? So believe it or not, ICC writes a book every time the code changes, they write a book, it's called the significant changes to whatever code, the International Building Code or the International Fire Code. It's a book about an inch thick outlining all of the changes that have happened in the last three years on that wet cone cycle. They do not write a book on what's changed from 06 to 21, right? And so there's, when you talk to them at ICC and you say, well, we're on the 06, what's changed? They just kind of giggle. Um, there's been a lot changed, and the, the stack of books is like six inches thick. I had to buy one for every year, and I had to go through it. And so I literally, and if you can pull up that, um, it's the Excel spreadsheet on the code changes. So from 06 to 2021, there's, so this is, what I did was I took every one of the changes that happened in the code and, yep, and so, let me put my glasses on, I can't read this little print here. So for example, section 3114, public restrooms in flood hazard areas, right? So, oh, I just lost where I was reading. You just I know, it. sorry, there we go, I was trying to enlarge it. Okay, well, let's do 2902.3, public toilet facilities, okay? It, it's not addressed in the 06 code. It's not addressed in the 09 code. It's not addressed in the 12 code. In the 15 code, they said, limited size, quick service tenant spaces are no longer required to provide toilet facilities for public customers. So in the previous codes, you had to have a certain size of a restroom. They've eliminated that. So the code, if, if it has, it improves things as far as costs as well. So that would have been a cost to the contractors or the owners having to provide a certain amount of area. Well, they've, they've eliminated that, so that reduced the cost. So things change up, down, uh, the codes are um, clarified, removed, added, um, or uh, eliminate, uh, no longer relevant. So those are the code changes that can occur. And then in the 18, that they didn't have any more code changes on that one section. Uh, okay, and we'll go back out of this. But that shows you that Every one of the code changes that have happened, and there's been 764 items that have been changed. Some of them have been changed every single year, right? They offer a code change 
one year, the next year they find out that didn't really work well, so we gotta go change it this much more. So they change it again. Oh, we're getting closer, but we still have an issue. They change it. So that's how the code changes work, okay? There's been 764 changes in just the International Building Code from 06 to 21, okay? Obsolete sections are removed, pertinent sections have been added, okay? Just go uh, from current slide. Well, I know, but I wanted to get rid of that. This. Yeah, just go up to current slide, right above, right there, click. Okay. Um, so what's changing and why are they changing? Um, and you can read in your, your thing here, but I'll just hit a couple of them. Uh, new methods have been developed. They resolve conflicts, new materials, new systems apply, uh, disasters. Um, how many here have remember what happened in Florida here this, this year with the condo collapses, right? I can tell you that from the, the code side of things, we're all discussing that. There's gonna be significant changes coming about for anything over four stories tall, which really doesn't affect anything in Montezuma County, right? But anything over four stories tall now is gonna to have to have an annual inspection by an outside certified third party. So think of all those people now, there's some of those four story hotels, right? and you can't inspect it, and you can't hire the inspector. It has to be a third party coming in looking at it. So that's gonna drive the costs up on some of this stuff. But it's because things have been overlooked and we've got issues now. Okay. Next slide. Thank you. So how does this affect Dolores? So new buildings are gonna be required to comply with the new minimum requirements in the 2021 code. Existing buildings, that's the ones that are already here in the town, right? We're gonna have three levels of compliance. Level one, let's go to that one. Level one alterations include the removal and replacement or covering the existing materials, wall materials, elements, equipment. I wanna change my kitchen sink. I wanna change my water heater, right? Uh, anything that's kind of minor, uh, replace kitchen cabinets is another example. Level one is the least impacted by the codes. They do not require a permit. Okay, most of the time. So level one most of the time does not require a permit. However, like I alluded to in the very start of this thing, it's recommended that you have your clients just call the town and tell us what you're wanting to do. We'll tell you whether a permit's required or not. A lot of times it's not required. Okay, next one is level two. Level two is a little bit more in depth, right? So we're gonna reconfigure some space. I'm gonna move this wall and extend it four more feet because I want a bigger living room, right? That requires a permit. It's a level two remodel. It has a lot more requirements to come into play once you start doing stuff like that because of exiting mainly. So if you're changing the exit paths in a building, you may be restricting exit travels, okay? Uh, I wanna remove an exterior door. I don't want that door there. I'm gonna close that wall up, right? That requires a permit. It's also a level two remodel, okay? All right, next one in. Level three, this is the one where we're gonna remodel the entire building, right? or at least 50% of the building. So once that hit, this hits 50% remodel, all of the requirements in the code come into effect, okay? So if I'm gonna take this building and I'm gonna remodel in half the side of the building, that area that I'm working in now has to be brought up to code. Now, more than likely, the other side may not have to be brought up to code. Does that make sense? So we're not gonna make you tear out the other half to bring this half up to code, right? Now. There are some electrical things that, that may require this side to be have the electrical brought up or the plumbing brought up. So there may be ish, uh, maybe systems or components that have to be brought up to the current code, but more than likely it won't happen that way. Um, if you're working, let's say we've got a two-story house, we've got one right, right over here on Second Street, they're completely remodeling the upstairs. They're not doing anything downstairs. That second story has to come into compliance with the new code and all of the components that lead to the exit. So the staircase has to meet the requirements even though they're not touching it. Um, the hallway that goes to the front door has to meet the requirements even though they're not touching it because you're exiting an area that's completely being remodeled. So there's a whole lot of stuff that goes into level three. All right, okay, in. Historic buildings, okay? If you have a building that you think is historic, it has to be one of three things. It has to be nationally recognized, state recognized, or locally recognized in a program that the national 
um, and I can't remember who it is that requires them to, uh, Department of the Interior. So if you have a community out there, um, and I don't know, Dolores is our local rec uh, historic district is recognized by the Department of the Interior. But let's just say, I don't know, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on Mancus, right? So let's say Heather over there, uh, they have a local historic registry, but it's not nationally recognized by the Department of the Interior. It's, it's fair game in anything in the building code, okay? It is not historic according to the building code. So once it's listed on one of these three registries, it's an historic building, okay? That does not mean that it doesn't have to meet the requirements of the code. It still has to meet certain levels of the code, okay? And anything that you do in that building. So for example, let's say we have a two-story uh, hotel and the staircase has balusters, one on every step, right? That does not meet the code because you have to have no more than a four inch gap between those two balusters, right? And it's so that a kid can't stick their head between there and get stuck. That's where it came from. Now, in the old days, they used to put one baluster on every step. That staircase into the new codes do not meet the requirements. In an historic structure, if you're remodeling and you don't do anything with that staircase, you don't have to bring that staircase up to code. If you remove those components and put them back, now they have to meet the new code, okay? So now you're gonna have two balusters for every step, right? So uh, the Del Rio, I'll use it as an example over here. The Del Rio has, it's an historic structure. It's, it's uh, locally recognized, so it's historic. They have stripped the entire interior of that building. So the entire interior of that building is no longer historic, okay? So it's all bets off. It has to meet the current code on the inside, okay? So that's how they look at historic buildings. All right, next. Let's talk about the elephant in the room. This is the one that's gonna get everybody all riled up. Um, it's gonna especially get the contractors riled up. And what it is, um, I wanna point out that in the 2006 International Building Code that's already adopted, this requirement's already there, okay? That came in in 06. So what it is, is it says any R occupancy has to be suppressed, it's required. So single family house has to have a fire system in it, sprinklers, okay? That's in the code currently. The town of Dolores has never enforced it in the past. I gave the contractors two years. I told them that in 19, I was gonna start enforcing it. Um, they asked for a year, uh, give us some time. Uh, there were two contractors working in town, time, in town at the time. So I said, all right, I'm gonna, I'll give a year and then I'm gonna start enforcing it. I'm not going to enforce it on single family detached structures, okay? I'm not enforcing it. If you wanna build a single family house, it doesn't have to have a sprinkler system. You wanna build a duplex, it's gonna have a sprinkler system, okay? Now, I gave them that year, then it was supposed to start, and then what happened last year? Flipping COVID, right? So I said, all right, I'm gonna give another year. And then I told them, January 2021, I'm gonna start enforcing this. So I've been enforcing it this year. I have had not one building that's required a sprinkler system until just the other day. I had another guy come in wants to build a duplex. That building, will be sprinklered. It's the first one in a two year period. So I'm enforcing what's already in, in, in place, right? So it's in the code, it's gonna stay in the code. We are going to draft, um, you can go to the next section, I think's where it's at. We're going to draft a proposed amendment to this code. And it's going to say, if you want to build a single family residence detached, right? Under 3,500 square feet, including the garage, you don't have to sprinkler it. There's not one house in the town of Dolores that's 3,500 square feet. There's not one house in the town of Dolores that would have to have a sprinkler system that's a single family detached structure, okay? So there's one lot left in town where they could build a house that's gonna have 3,500 or more square feet. If they come in, that somebody comes in and buys that lot and they wanna build a 4,000 square foot house, they're gonna put a sprinkler system in that house. It's not gonna happen, right? So. Same thing happens in the IRC. I had to address it in the IRC too, which is the International Residential Code, because they build under a different code than the International Building Code. 
It's a little less stringent. Um, same thing, detached single family residence, less than 3,500 square feet, including attached garages and under Eve lines, shall be exempt from the requirement. Okay? Now, what that means is in the town of Dolores, um, if you have a duplex or triplex, a new one, you're going to put a sprinkler system in that building. You're going, you're going to build a new duplex, it's going to have a suppression system. Okay? Now, these suppression systems are expensive. I'm not going to kid anybody. Um, the latest uh, the, the quote that the gentleman got on this duplex up here is, is uh, about $12,000 per side, so $24,000. However, he gets to remove this two-hour firewall that's in there. He doesn't have to have that, okay? It's been taking him a week to build that firewall, so he's got a week of wages that he gets to cut out. He gets to cut out two layers of sheetrock, and he gets to cut out one whole wall, right? So all the cost for the, the wall. Um, I put some numbers to it. It's about nine grand. Okay, so he gets to eliminate nine grand, and he's going to spend twenty-four grand, right? So it's really thirteen grand, right? So if you look at it as six thousand dollars per side, the insurance companies are going to get a ten percent break on that property. So over time, it's going to pay for it, right? Um, the reason this is happening is because, as our customer over here that I alluded to that that complained about his his FEMA flood insurance going up from $600 to $1,500, right? So, so that's, that's a huge increase. He's not using building permits. He's not, he's not gonna, I don't need a building permit, I don't want a building permit, and yet I'm being impacted by those that are building in this town because we're not on the current code. And so everybody in the town's insurance rates are affected by this versus the few people that are doing building permit stuff, right? Now let's take an existing building. Let's say that we've got um, a duplex and they want to remodel one half of it, right? But they're only gonna change part of it. They're not gonna have to add a sprinkler system to that, right? But let's say they come in and they wanna completely gut one side and they wanna remodel that side, right? The whole thing, they're gonna have to suppress that half of the building, okay? <laughs> not the other half where they're not doing anything. Now, how many times have you met somebody that's gone in and completely gutted the interior of a duplex, right? I mean, we're talking down to the stud walls. All the electrical's taken out, all the plumbing's taken out. Very rarely does somebody buy something and do that to it, right, to that level of extent in an attached type duplex. They do it in single family houses a lot or an area, right? Um, commercial buildings is the other one that's gonna, that's gonna be affected. Let's say that you buy um, the doctor's office, we'll use that as an example. You sell that to a customer and they say, I want to open up an antique mall in the front and I'm going to live in the back, right? That building's going to have to have a fire suppression system because you've turned it into an R, okay? If it stays a, a B in the town of Dolores, it's not going to have to have a sprinkler system, okay? And in the town of Dolores, the majority of the buildings will never have to have a sprinkler system because most sprinklers don't kick in until there's 10,000 square feet or more. And in the town under the land use code, we have a limit of 10,000 square feet. So the two don't cross, right? So in the town of Laura, somebody who comes in and they wanna build a new hardware store, right? The biggest hardware store they can build in the town of Laura's is 10,000 square feet. 10,000 square feet does not require a sprinkler system, okay? So most commercial buildings that are built in the town are not going to require a sprinkler system. The one that will is restaurants because it's 5,000 square feet. That's not a very big restaurant, right? Or an occupant load of 100 or more. So if you get a restaurant that has an occupant load of 100 or more, it has to have a suppression system. Now, if you build a new restaurant and it hits those markers, it's going to have to have a suppression system. If you, have, if you buy me tequilas on the end of town here, right? It's not 5,000 square feet. It does not have to have a suppression system. Even if they completely remodel the place, it does not require a suppression system because it doesn't have an aqua load of 100 and it's not 5,000 square feet or more, okay? So we're talking about very limited properties. Marijuana buildings are the other one. In the town of Dolores, we did this specifically, we require any kind of marijuana building, dispensary, grow, anything, has to have a suppression system, regardless of how many square feet, okay? They're doing one right now. The suppression system's already been installed. It's right here on the end of town, okay? There's a lot of reasons behind that. One of them is firefighter safety because they put 
they put these rooms in there, they put steel on the walls so that people can't get through the walls. Well, that's how firefighters get out of the building if they get trapped, they cut a hole through the wall. If it's all steel, they can't get out of the building. So that's one of the reasons for that. Okay, next hand. <clears throat> 13D systems. So these structures that are duplexes and triplexes and fourplexes can install a 13D system. So in the sprinkler world, there's three kinds. There's 13D, which means domestic. There's 13R, which means residential, like hotels, motels. And then there's 13, which means commercial buildings. The differences are the 13 is the most expensive and every place has to have a sprinkler system. Okay, 13 R's, there's areas that don't have to have it. 13 D, the difference is it runs on the same water system that comes into the house. So you don't have a separate water system for the sprinkler system. They just tie on to your existing water tap coming into the house. Now you may have to have a little bit bigger water tap. You might have to go from a five eighths to three quarter. Okay, but then what it does is it has piping that goes to the sprinkler heads and every appliance, right? So your toilet has a line that goes to it and then from there it goes up to the sprinkler head. So every time you flush the toilet, water moves everywhere in your house, right? If there's a fire, the sprinkler head will pop and only one head pops, not like the movies where they all go off and everything gets wet. It's one head that goes off and suppresses the fire, okay? 13D systems are the, the least uh, expensive. They're, they're minimal expense, uh, however, they're still expensive. But plumbers can install this. So I've been working with several plumbers. I've got two that have signed on to take the classes that are required to install these systems. So it doesn't have to be a licensed sprinkler contractor. It can be a plumber. So they're working on that right now. Okay. Uh, I've already talked about that. State of Colorado. So what is the state doing? So the Department of Fire Prevention Control, DFPC, just this last year adopted the 2021 fire code for enforcement in the entire state. That includes Montezuma County. So if you have a, a nursing home, a daycare, a hospital, any kind of state kind of building, even in Montezuma County, they have to follow the 2021 fire code, okay? Uh, the 2021 IFC must be enforced by the town in the, our town, we have to enforce that. So we're already having to enforce it for the schools, the daycares, um, a couple of the medical buildings, we have to enforce that, okay? Uh, Colorado House Bill 19-1260 updated the 2007 state law that established a minimum building energy code. So as of that date, August 2nd, we now have to require, we are required to be on the most current edition of the energy code. If you think sprinklers are restrictive, where do you read the requirements in the energy code, okay? Some of that stuff, like you cannot put single pane windows in a house, that it is not allowed, it's illegal. You can't have openings of certain size on walls, right? Because you're losing too much energy through that, like this wall behind you, right? That would be a no-no because you're losing too much energy in this building, right? You're putting the energy through that glass to the outside. The energy code is very restrictive. The state's adopted it and they've said, we have to be on it, okay? All right, next. So timeline, um, this meeting is one of the meetings we're having. I'm gonna meet with the Home Builders Association and we're gonna have a public meeting as well to kind of just, just inform people, hey, this is what's happening, this is how it works. Um, and so we're gonna have the code ready to go by January 1st. Uh, and then there'll be a six month grace period if the builder wants to build uh, up till uh, July 1st, <clears throat> they can build under the 06 code or the 21 code. But after July 1st, it's going to be the 21 code. Okay. And that's that part. <coughs> All right. So I just want to go over. You can, did I put this on there, Ann? I don't know if I did or not. The main point. Document. I don't know if I put it on there. Yeah. You got it. Yep. I need to share it to And so, just to kind of quickly wrap up here and then we'll take questions. <coughs> Commercial buildings are not residential structures. Okay, so that's one of the big things we've been having problems with. We've got like three or four that have been converted illegally um, to residential structures. They require a permit and a change of use from the town to have a residential portion or to convert to residential. 
just because it says, um, and I've had a couple of people call and say, hey, what's the, what's the zoning for this particular building? And I know that when they ask me that, I have to tell them, zoning doesn't mean anything, right? Zoning means it's approved for that use, but it doesn't mean that necessarily that use is going to get used in that building, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. They require a fire suppression system if they have any residential in it, right? Now, I'm not talking existing building. I'm talking if somebody wants to con come in and buy the doctor's office and they want to convert it to, you know, a boutique up front and my, my living quarters in the back, it's going to require a suppression system. They cannot be occupied as a residence without meeting all the requirements. In other words, you can't just say, yeah, go ahead and move in, right? They cannot move into that building as a residence. Uh, unapproved residential occupancies and commercial buildings are not exempt from the requirements outlined in level one or two. What that means is, let's say the doctor's office, which, which by the way, has been converted to residential, they don't have a permit, it hasn't been done legally, uh, it doesn't have to meet the requirements. Let's say they want to remodel and they want to bring it up to code. It does not eliminate the requirements in that in the update, right? Level one and two remodels require a sprinkler system. Short-term rentals, uh, they require a permit. Um, right now, we probably have, I have at least six or seven that I've sent a permit application to, but they're still operating as a short-term rental. They don't have a permit. So they're, they're fixing to get in trouble. Um, the town has set a limit of 22, and it's, a, it's based on 7%. Right now, it's 22. Um, it requires the state of Colorado sales tax license unless you're using VRBO or Airbnb. So we're telling these folks, if, you, if you're registered in Airbnb or VRBO, they collect your sales tax and your lodge tax for you, right? So you don't have to have a sales tax license. If, however... You use those applications, but from time to time you rent it out on your own. You have to have your own state of sales, Colorado sales tax license, and you have to collect the taxes for those times. Um, <clears throat> fines can be levied for unapproved short-term rentals. And then I want to, real quickly, right now you probably need to follow this. There's a couple of, I don't know if they're House Senate bills or House bills, at the Colorado State Legislature where they are looking at short-term rentals. Short-term rentals are becoming an issue in the state and, and the nation. And you're gonna see serious requirements come about because of short-term rentals, okay? Because what's, it's, it's killing the hotel and, and motel market, number one. Um, they don't have the same requirements as hotel motel. So residential properties pay, what, 6.9% taxes and commercial are paying 21, thereabouts, right? So they pay way more taxes to be a hotel or motel. So what's happening at the state is they're like, okay, there's two things. One of them is, well, if you're gonna use your property as a short-term rental, we're gonna require you to, you're gonna be paying a commercial tax rate because you're not gonna get the residential tax rate anymore. So that one, I don't think is gonna pass. The one I think is going to pass is if you use your house, your property, your residential property, at a tax rate of 6.1% or whatever it is, right? And then you rent it out for 100 days, you're going to pay commercial rates for those 100 days. I think that's the one that's going to pass. So it's, it's coming. That's what's happening with short-term rentals. Okay, building permits. <clears throat> Contact the town for any kind of remodel. That's, that's the simplest thing I can say. If you sell a property in town, I, I'm going to ask that you that you take a copy of this and you give it to every prospective buyer, right? You can just say, hey, in the town, and Mancus as well. Mancus is tied into this meeting right now today because Heather is, they're going to be going to the 21 code as well. So they're tying into what we're doing so they don't have to reinvent the wheel. So it's going to be, it's going to be hitting both towns at the same time, I'm thinking. Um, I don't know for sure if that's what Heather has planned, but that's the direction she's going um, so if you took this and handed it out to your prospective customers, right? Hey, if you do anything in Mancus or the town of Dolores, here's what you have to do if you're going to, you know, for a building permit. Here's what you have to do for zoning stuff. Here's what you have to do for short-term rentals. And then tell them, call us. You know, I don't mind even meeting with them at their location and walking through with them and having them explain to me what they're planning on doing. And then I can tell them, yeah, it's going to requ require a permit. Or no, you don't have to have a permit, right? That's the best way to do it. And then suppression systems. <clears throat> Remember, 
The requirement for suppression system is already in the current code. It's just never been enforced. Okay, we started enforcing it this year. Uh, it's only going to be required in detached single family that are 3,500 square feet or more. Okay, so big houses in the town of Dolores are going to have to have a suppression system. It's not happening. Nobody's building that big house in town. Uh, and they are going to be required in commercial buildings that have a residential area. Okay, if it's an existing one, like I'm going to use the the uh, Dolores Food Market right across the street. That's a grocery store, and then the one the building goes this way. That's residential. They live in the back, right? It it does not require a sprinkler, a sprinkler system. Now, if they remodel that place, the whole entire place, they're going to have to put a suppression system in. They're never going to remodel that entire place, right? So that building's never going to have to have a suppression system. Now, let's say that thing, God forbid, burns down and they want to replace it, they're going to have to put it back with a sprinkler system if they want to live in it, right? Okay, so that's, that's where it's going. That's what all of this is about. Um, we're trying to clear up some issues in town that we've that have become legal issues now. Um, anyhow, we're trying to create everything here to get cleaned up. All right. Now I'm going to open it up to anybody that has questions. And can you watch the? I don't have the control panel, so I don't know if anybody's. So out there, uh, <clears throat> that those joining by Zoom, if you have questions, um, just chime in and. And we'll let you in the room. Bonnie Turn your. So it looks like Bonnie Lake. Go ahead, Bonnie. You'll have to unmute yourself. Can we get a copy of your printout of your your meeting highlights? That was very good. Absolutely. So what I'm going to recommend is I'm going to tell everybody my email address. You send me a request, and I'll send you all this electronic data. So my my email is David at townofdolores.com so that once again, that's david at townofdolores.com you send me a request I'll send you all this information and if you have okay. questions you think so, something later too you know just give me a holler okay. okay sounds great thank you you bet thank you so right now the Oh, that's, I, I apologize, I forgot that. So right now in the town of Dolores, we are completely rewriting our zoning. So we've been, that's been about a 12, 14 month process too. Mostly is relabeling, we created new zones. So we'll be just relabeling the residential zones and their new um, shorthand ID. And the downtown commercial district will be renamed. Um, the zone boundaries, haven't changed. They're just the designated zones. Uh, they're, they've been renamed, and then some of the standards for the, each of those zones have been changed. So. Right. So we're. Just the limit of 22 um, short term rentals, that's just within the city limits, right? Yes. Once you get out in the county. Yes. So Montezuma County currently has no regulations on short term rentals. So Everything that I'm discussing today applies only to the town limit, incorporated town limits of the town of Dolores. So that this three mile run up this canyon from canyon wall to canyon wall is pretty much all that we're talking about for, for everything I've talked about today. Um, Mancus, as I had told you before, um, they're, they're on board. They, they want to go to the 2021 code too. I, the short term re rental regulation stuff, I don't know where they're at. I, did hear that they put a moratorium on them over there, or they're going to. I, I don't know where they're at. I, I shouldn't even say. So, yeah, Montezuma County, it's wide open. They can do whatever they want. Um, there's no regulations. I, I don't know. I don't know where this thing's going to go. Um, like I said, I sit on code hearings, and one of the big topics right now is short-term rental. I really think there's going to be some real serious stuff coming down the pike, um, especially there's been a couple of fatal fires. Um, so the more of that that happens, you're, you're going to see them clamp down on short-term rentals. I mean, it's going to be a, it is going to be a regulated industry before long. Okay. More questions? You have already talked about this. How do you define a short-term rental? Okay. A short-term rental is a residential occupancy other than a hotel or motel. Hotel and motel, by definition, are short-term rental, but they're not short-term rental. They're, they're their own 
division, right? Um, so short-term rental is, is defined as any residential property that is, that is rented on a less than 30-day basis, okay? So if it's if you rent your property out for 31 days, it does not require it does not meet the requirements for short term rental. But if you rent it out from one to 30 days, that's a short term rental. Okay. And so in the town of Dolores, that same definition applies. If you're going to rent your property out from one to 30 days, it's going to be called a short term rental. Now you can have a short term rental that's also a long term rental, right? So we actually have somebody that pulled a permit. They've passed the permit process. They've got one issue to them, but they're they're renting their property right now. It's rented for three months, right? So it's not a short-term rental, but he pulled a permit because he does do short-term rental from time to time. And so after this, I don't I don't remember what he said. These people are here for. Um, they're using it as home base, I think. So, but they're going all across the Western United States. This is like their home base, right? Um, so they're going to be here 30 day, uh, three months, and at the end of that, they're leaving, and then it's going to be back to short-term rental stuff, okay? That answer your question? Yeah. Okay. The fire suppression system on the duplexes. Okay. Is that new to 2021? I mean, that seems pretty strange. There's no, a lot that's, of municipalities doing that? Yes, a lot of municipalities are doing that. Um, Durango has some pretty strict requirements for residential properties. They've got a couple of subdivisions that the entire subdivision is suppressed. Even on single family. Even on single family, yeah. Um, so what happened was in 20, 2003, uh, there were some serious fires. And so then in 2006, the ICC people um, started looking at the residential sprinkler stuff. A lot of states have mandated that you can't enforce it. So, so uh, I know that New Jersey is one of them. They have, and Michigan, <clears throat> their state legislature has actually said you can't adopt sprinkler ordinances. They've prohibited it. Um, some states are now requiring it. Oregon is one. Washington is one. It's not even an option. You have to do it. Um, I don't know where it's going to end up. I mean, it's the, the biggest thing is the, the, a man's house is his castle rule, right? Um, telling somebody that your single family house has to have a suppression system in it, right? It's kind of, a lot of people look at it like that's overreach. That's why we did this, the, the amendments, right? And we set a size limit on it, okay? So we said, if you're going to have a single family house, right? We're not going to force you to put a sprinkler system in it. Right? We're not going to require it. But if you're attaching it to other people's houses, right? Or above them or below them, um, that's been in the code for a long time. Right, but I mean, you got those party walls that can separate them too. You get, you get away from the fire suppression, right? Not in the new codes. Not in the new mm -hmm. codes. Are you guys putting fire suppression in this building? In this building? Probably not required. We, no, we're not remodeling this building. So if we ever had to remodel this building, we probably still wouldn't have to because it's under the requirement for square footage. And I'm, I'm just playing devil's advocate. If I'm a community member, you're probably going to get pushback saying, oh, the town hall's not going to be fire suppressed. My duplex that I'm trying to put up down the street next sure. to you when I could be safe with just a car to wall. Yeah, well, they're not safe, but they're safer. But yeah, they're still not safe. But yeah, so if we, let's say that we wanted to convert that from that wall that way, we're going to put, Anne's going to move in here. She's going to live here. So now, now we have to put a suppression system in here, right? It's the residential part that requires it. So yeah, so yeah, there's gonna be some people, the current uh, gentleman that's doing the, the duplex right now was, you know, he was upset about the, the sprinkler because he's, he's built three or four in town already that just had to have a, fire, a, a firewall, yeah. right? And now that's not gonna apply. He has to have a suppression system, yeah. It, 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 and like I said, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an issue. Yeah. But like I said, you know, I tried to address it like the elephant in the room. Um, it's not going to affect that many people. And then is it fair for all the citizens in the town of Dolores to have to pay so that a few people can build duplexes and profit from that? And that, that getting that fiber right now, what mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, it's a building rating effective schedule. You have to, your duplexes have to be, have fire suppression systems now. Yes, because we have to adopt, we have to adopt the current building code, which has that in there. And then they've specifically said, 
if you amend, because they see communities amending the code. And, and, and here's a question for you. How do you make a minimum standard less minimum? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna kid you. It's gonna be, it's gonna be an issue for a little bit, right? Once it gets past that point and there's more people doing it and the prices come down, right? Durango's been doing it for years now on certain residential properties. They have sprinkler ordinances and basically theirs are in the county area. If you go somewhere where there's no water system, you gotta put a suppression system in it, right? Twin Buttes, that new subdivision between here and Durango on this side of Durango, that everything in that is suppressed. Everything, every single house has a suppression system in it. That was the only way the fire department would approve that subdivision was they required suppression systems. Okay, anything else? I don't see anybody raising their hand. You can find permit fees and everything online on the website. The building department fees? Right. Now, right now, you can't do, you can't fill an application out online. We tried that, but what happened was there were so many mistakes being filled out that it was, it made a more complicated meeting. We're just recommending come in, meet with us, because I'll sit down with everybody. We'll go through the entire process. We're a FEMA regulated town, so we have a whole bunch of documents we have to fill out for FEMA, even if it doesn't apply. Uh, elevation certificates is the main one, and it's a huge document that even if you're just putting, I don't know, remodeling your house, I have to fill that out. Basically, I fill all this stuff out to say, no, it's not required, right? So that the government is, we have government to answer to, too, as well, so. Well, I want to thank you all for coming. I, yeah, really, I really do appreciate it. Um, look forward to working with all of you. Like I said, if you, if you want any more of this, if you want to take some of these to hand out at the office or whatever, feel free. Um, and for goodness sake, take some of those donuts. <laughs> Okay, can you go ahead and stop everything? Stop all the recording.